And of course, the webinar will be recorded and made available uh, to, well, to all of you uh, publicly on the Open Air website next week. So um, I was saying that we got a few questions on Mentimeter. And, uh, yeah, I just went to that, but I, they're not loading for me. OK, um, so if you want, I can share my screen. Uh, yeah, maybe while, you share your screen instead. Yeah, while you um, reply to, to this. <laughs> And then we see if there's anything else popping up in the chat. So, okay, sounds good. Okay, so let me see if you see anything. Hmm. Okay, so I can see that now. Um, somebody asking, does my data need to be fair or open? Yeah, that's a good question, um, actually. <laughs> Yeah, 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 completely. Um, so the way I would describe it is that these two concepts overlap. Um, so data could be fair, but not open, or it could be open, but not fair. Um, and it could also be both. And I, I think it depends on the policy requirements that you're responding to, whether your data needs to be one or both. If you're responding to the European Commission, they have an open data pilot and they are also pushing for fair data management. That's the way their guidelines have been framed. So really you need to try and address both. But one of the things the EC covered in their, um, in their guidelines for the pilot was that data needs to be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So it doesn't mean that all data need to be open. Um, but ideally, you should be making them open if you can. And I think it's it's better to share under restrictions rather than not at all. So I would see the sharing as a, a spectrum. Ideally, you'd get as close to open as you can. But um, if there are restrictions that need to be in place, that's that's not an issue. And similarly, FAIR is, is a scale. Um, a, well, the perspective we've put forward through the FAIR Data Expert Group is that, like, a base level of FAIR would be to have identifiers and metadata and access to either the metadata or the data, ideally. Um, but you can make your data increasingly FAIR by um, ensuring there's rich description, um, that it's accessible under common protocols, um, and by making sure that you know there's a clear usage license so that people know what they can do with your data. So both open and fair on scales and ideally your data would be both um, but you know there may be reasons why your data can't be open I'm not sure there are good reasons why your data can't be fair because fair is about making sure your data are reusable so making sure they're well documented and I I can't think of good reasons why data can't be um, it may be that there's it would take too many resources uh, or too much effort to make your data reusable. Um, so, yeah, potentially that's a reason not to be fair, but I think you should be striving to make your data as reusable as possible if you're sharing it. Uh, that's a really good answer. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I'm now passing to the next one. Okay. So when you're in a multidisciplinary project with different types of data, how do you create metadata and what format do you use is a software that can automatically generate metadata um, so to be honest you're best to have discipline specific metadata if you can so that the metadata um, matches your data type and what people from that research area would expect to see um, described you know so the the kind of richer information that would be needed for reuse so it might be that you do adopt multiple different metadata standards in a project that has very different types of data um, so some kind of multidisciplinary projects may have you know some social science data and some genomics data and and there are going to be different metadata standards for those data types um, so it might be that that there's multiple um, metadata uh, standards in use there are catalogues of different standards um, and I'll point to a couple um, I can maybe I'll add them into the chat um, there's one the research data alliance metadata standards catalog um, and there's another fair sharing which is focused mainly on the life sciences but is doing um, work in other areas as well now um, and there you can search for relevant standards and a number of these standards have um, tools that help you create the metadata as well so I'll just 
it's going to search metadata standards catalog. Yeah, and I think we can also add these links um, to the webinars page as a supplementary yeah. resource um, yeah. with the recording. So, so that whoever and whoever asks this question and is not maybe in, in the webinar right now can find your answer in the <laughs> in the recordings and then all the, the materials as well. Yeah, I'll actually, I'll maybe just very briefly share screen. I don't know if that will just boot you off if I... Yeah, just, well, I, I just make me stop my sh screen sharing. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then I can just show this resource here. I'm making you presenter again in case... Okay. okay. <laughs> Here we go. So, so this is the metadata standards catalog. Um, you can see, you can view the standards. You can search by discipline. Um, you can also view tools that are available to develop metadata for these different standards. Um, and then the other thing, the other resource I'll also put in the chat is fair sharing. Um, and one of the nice things about this resource is it's essentially a, a series of linked databases. So you can look at the standards, um, but you can also see which databases they're used in and whether the standards are recommended in different policies from journals or funders um, or, you know, what domains these standards are covering. So I think they're, they're two useful resources to, to look at for metadata standards. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, is anyone willing to ask any questions right now from from the participants? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can add things into the chat, or we can actually just give you the microphone control if it's easier to just ask a question out mm -hmm. rather yeah. than typing it. Yeah, we are not the so, just... so it would be quite easy to to manage. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering the two kind of topics that we covered in the the presentations were about um, data management in general. Um, I don't know if you'll have all seen the videos, but um, Venkat did um, a presentation on reviewing well basics in good research data management and some tips for reviewing DMPs. Um, so that outlines what research data management is and this need for fair. Um, and essentially what it what it covers is some things that we've highlighted to project officers at the EC when they're reviewing data management plans. So some of the some of the aspects that have the biggest effect on the fairness of the data. So um, you'll see the in that presentation he gives, we talk about the data formats and metadata because that's what makes data reusable if it's in open formats and has rich metadata. We cover data licenses with them, um, the need to deposit in repositories, because that's quite a big part of the Commission's policy, and also the need for persistent identifiers. So that's what you'll see covered in, in the first presentation. And then there's a, another presentation where um, I gave an overview to data management plans and some of the recent trends um, and the things that we indicated there are that more funders are asking for DMPs. I think we've seen a big increase across Europe of national funders starting to introduce policies um, or, you know, enhancing their policies. The Commission's policy has changed over the last couple of years. Um, and then there's, there's some shifts in those policies. So I think there's an increasing onus on universities in terms of the implementation of the policies and the DMPs and also that data management plans are starting to cover more than just data so looking at the code as well and, and other research outputs and then I reflected on how funders are evaluating DMPs and I'm happy to speak about experiences with the Commission or other UK funders if that's useful. Um, and then the other trend is just the, the growing number of data management planning tools and we pointed to a, no a number of those in the, the presentation. And then the final point was about the kind of future directions in terms of DMPs for open and, and machine actionable and fair 
DMPs and, and again there are activities going on through a number of international fora which we can reflect on here in, in this discussion. Um, Sarah, before I lose it in between the chat, there is a question from Emily about yeah. how long you should keep the data as a best practice because uh, I don't remember any reference to this in the uh, guidelines for from the European Commission. Yeah, yeah so from the European, this. yeah, from the European Commission, they don't specify a length that a period that data should be kept for. There's not a kind of preservation requirement per se, but they do say that data have to be deposited in repositories. So they want to make sure that it's in a service where it is going to be more robust rather than just on institutional servers or, um, you know, kept by the researcher themselves and put on their website. Um, it's interesting in the UK that preservation period isn't covered in every funder's policy either. There's a kind of range. Some do specify a, a period um, between three, five or ten years are the most common ones noted. Um, but a lot of them don't specify a, an exact preservation period. Um, but yeah, I think with the EC they're really just stressing the repository deposit so that it is in somewhere that's a bit more robust. And I see um, Sabrina has asked if she could be made um, presenter so she yeah. can ask a question. So maybe if we make, I don't know if you can do that because I'm not sure yeah, I've got and, right. And, and meanwhile, there's another question um, wh while I'm doing this. Um, yeah. Another question from Lavorka Kaya. Uh, we should be responsible for the quality of the research data published in repositories because data should be well documented if we want to reuse it. Yeah, um, so this, I would say this is why it's important if there are subject specific repositories um, to use those because you're then, your data is going to be curated by somebody who is a professional in that given research area. Um, and now repositories won't, you know, automatically check the quality of the data because that's really the researcher's responsibility and it's something that reusers would flag but at least they'll be familiar with the standards or if there, you know, if there were obvious errors with the data or it was just in a state where it's really not reusable at all, um, I think those things would get picked up a lot more if it's being looked at by people who, you know, work in that particular research field. Um, so I think the responsibility ultimately lies with the researcher, but if you're using a domain-specific repository, there are likely to be, you know, some more checks or a better understanding of your data type. Thanks, Sarah. Meanwhile, Sabrina left, so I can't. We, we, I hope <laughs> that she will reconnect to ask her question. Uh, there's yeah, a new okay. question from Sarah Moni. Um, okay, she, I think this is in line with the question before from Emily, and she's also asking if there's any tip about data management uh, plans, tools apart from DMP Online. Yeah, so we, we mentioned a number of tools in the presentation. I don't know if you'll have seen that, but there is, there's an increasing number now um, across Europe. Um, so you've got DMP online from the DCC. And there's like a, a self-hosted version of that. Depending on what country you're in, there may well be a national kind of version of that. Um, so in Finland, there's the Thule service or in Denmark and Belgium and France, they have their own national level service. And to be honest, I think you should be using those where there is a, a local service because there's a group that's coordinating that and they're going to be more familiar with your national funders and, um, you know, potentially they have translations into your own language or a, a local help desk that's going to be much more familiar with your context. Um, in Germany, there's a tool called the RDM Organizer that's funded by the DFG. So again, if you're based in Germany, that's that's a relevant tool to use. And then the other ones I flagged were some coming out of Norway and also coming out of a, an Open Air and UDAC collaboration. Um, the Open Air and UDAC one is at, out in beta at the moment. Um, and the Norwegian ones, I think, um, kind of in the first year or two. So I'm not entirely sure about the status and how much they're kind of actively deployed and, and in use. Um, the other tool that I'd actually forgotten to mention in the slides is one that Elixir has developed, the Data Stewardship Wizard. So if you're dealing with life science research, that's a relevant service to use. Um, and I think 
after some of the one of the recent books by Baron de Mons, they've been pulling guidance out of that book to feed into the tool. So if you are in the life sciences, that's that's very very relevant as well. Um, so it really depends on where you're based and your context, what's most relevant to you. Yeah, and assuming that Sarah is Italian, um, there's nothing in, in Italy apart from uh, okay. some. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there's no structure tool as the ones you mentioned. Uh, there are some uh, initiatives from single institutions and there's also the translation of the Learn Project DMP checklist, um, which oh, okay. can okay. be a, a starting point. And I will put the link yeah. in the chat as well. Great, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it's definitely useful to use online tools, it can help, but similarly, if there's just a paper-based template, that can be useful to researchers. Um, so if there's a, a template that's translated in Italian, that's a good starting point. If you want to use DMP online, then um, by all means do. Um, it's free for end users, so anyone writing a DMP, but we are introducing a subscription model for people who want to customize the tool. So if unis want you know, their own branding and their own templates and guidance. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, are there any questions? This discussion is really interesting. Yeah, I'm interested to know where people are from. So are you supporting researchers with data management or are you um, writing DMPs yourself or doing research yourselves? I think you can either type or um, just switch on your microphone. We are not that many, so it won't be uh, a mess, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. So we yeah. have the first answer from Emily. Uh, she is a research support person and she's also reviewing DMPs. Yeah, and from University of Ljubljana as well, just above, so organizing oh, data yeah. support. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, okay. don't worry. Yeah, fine. Um, so, I, I mean, I suspect most people are probably doing the support side. And uh, I mean, one of the tips I'd give you about supporting data management and DMPs is just trying to have a range of services that you offer. Um, so as I mentioned a moment ago, online tools might be helpful for data management plans, but also paper-based templates are, are really handy. Um, having like one-on-one -on -one consultation clinics so that researchers can come and speak to you about their plan or like a library of example plans. I think you just want to try and have as broad a range of different inputs as possible so that people can then pick and choose what works best for them. Um, and similarly with research data management, you know, there's a whole suite of services you can offer, obviously all of the storage and data analysis support and the preservation, but it might be a lot to address at once if you're just getting started. So working in one area, maybe developing your policy and trying to get buy-in at the institutional level is a good starting point if you don't have anything or doing some training so that you start to get in touch with research communities and start to understand their needs and their kind of priorities for support is again another way of getting started. There's a long question. <laughs> yeah, uh, so well, from I Garrett. Observation more than a question, yeah, that's true. Okay, so I can I can read it out. So making research data fair will require that the metadata generated during processing is preserved along with the data itself. When it comes to RDM, decisions regarding deposit for long-term preservation should consider if this is possible in the repository of choice. While repository ingests will often involve creating new descriptive metadata to accompany the data set, the original metadata should also be accommodated using a wrapper such as METS as part of ingest. Yeah, and um, I think this is why, I mean, I've not got anything against generic repository services. I think they're really critical because a lot of um, research communities don't have a place of deposit. But I think this is a reason why if there is a subject specific repository, it's often better to work with them because they, you know, they'll understand what metadata is important um, to understand the processing steps and how that data is being created and, and used. Um, and as Garrett said, it's it's important to keep that metadata as well as just basic discovery metadata. So when you're looking at the FAIR principles, there's you know, four components. Obviously, the findability, 
which covers the discovery metadata. But then when you look at the more challenging aspects, the interoperability and reuse, that's, you know, that's all about kind of that subject specific information and making sure that 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 the data can be understood and are well described um, that there's kind of lots of documentation about how the data have been handled and all of the um, clarifications about any abbreviations in the data you know if you've used acronyms um, to record different values for example and information on how things have been measured so all of that information needs to be packaged up with the data as well. It's not just the, the data. And there's another question, which is not really for yeah. the scope of the, well, this webinar, but it will be definitely something to ask uh, during the webinar tomorrow on ask me whatever you want to know about open air. So if you yeah. find whoever asked this question, I will copy this question uh, to Mentimeter to keep a track yeah. of it for tomorrow. Um, I think that the, well, I'm, I'm just guessing the answer. Um, I, at n the answer could be no at the moment, but I invite you to join tomorrow's meeting at 3 p.m. Uh, to, to learn more about this. Yeah, I think um, it would be difficult I'm trying to think what information would be pulled out of the repositories, but I suspect it would be difficult for open air to distinguish between curated and non curated um, data sets. Yeah, because that, there's that there's like a metadata specification somewhere. Um, yeah, metadata yeah, exactly. That open air can read and, and collect. But yeah, um, yeah. We will know more so about in in <laughs> in re three in re three data you have some basic information about the repository you know like what policies it has um, I'm not sure if they capture information like you know what data process what processing is done on ingest into a repository and and to what extent um, the repository is doing curation whether they're you know have a period where they say this data will be preserved um, if they if there's a way for that kind of information to be captured and to be shared then i'm sure open air could distinguish between but i'm not sure that that's in any kind of metadata record about repositories just now yeah thank you very much sarah uh, meanwhile i posted this question on mentimeter so it will be answered tomorrow okay Any other questions, observations, curiosities, doubts? <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to know what what things um, you find most challenging as well. You know, what are the kind of pressing issues for you? So Emily Hermans has, has asked if there's a DMP repository. Um, no, not as far as I'm aware. Um, there are various different kind of publishing venues for, for data management plans. Um, so obviously people deposit in repositories. I know there's a, a fair number of, of DMPs from Horizon 2020 in Zenodo. I think because it's a deliverable, a lot of projects have put them in there. One thing that I think would be really great if Zenodo could do this is to actually add a classification type for DMP. So it's a, a type of record, so you can then filter that in the search. Um, because at the moment, you can't separate out actual data management plans from other outputs that uh, happen to be related to that. Um, in the Rio Journal, they, that's one of the kind of formal publication venues that accept DMPs. And there um, you can get a list. I think there was about 20 or so when I looked last. Um, obviously, um, DCC has been keeping a list of DMPs for a number of years. And through the DMP online platform, you can publish plans. So there's a list there. The other thing that I think is really interesting, Libra have been doing um, essentially collecting a catalog of data management plans. And they've been doing reviews, so using the Libra community to pick up the strengths and weaknesses of different plans. I think that's a really nice approach so that you're not just seeing a plan, you get some sense of you know the value of that plan. Um, and just the final point on this, we, we actually did make a recommendation um, in a report we did, I'll post a link to the report, through Open Air and the Fair Data Expert Group, we looked at the European Commission approach to Horizon 2020 DMPs and did a survey on that. And one of the recommendations we made was that there's 
it doesn't necessarily need to be a separate registry of, of data management plans, but there needs to be some kind of record of them. So it could be within a repository or a separate kind of collection of DMPs. But at the moment, they're, they're in various different places. There's a comment from Moitza regarding the challenges, uh, and she is saying that the culture of researchers in DMPs and data management in general is a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it, it's, it can be problematic because sometimes, you know, people are pressured in their working lives. There's already a lot of things they're asked to do by the university in terms of reporting or by their funders. Um, and this can just seem like, a you know, an additional piece of work. Um, and I, I think it's it's important that we make sure there are support staff in place to help with this. Um, the, the initial EOSC um, report that came out from the commission, I think I can't remember the figures now, but it was a huge amount. Um, it was like half a million or maybe even it was a significant amount of data stewards that they thought would be needed over the next um, kind of decade. Um, and it's a big gap because we need to skill people up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You've got, you know the figure better than me. Um, so I, I think it is important we have people to support research teams either based within the teams um, or at a more of a kind of institutional level where people can bring that expertise in. So they might not be able to support a full time post within that research group, but they still need access to data stewards or data support in some sense. And it might be a bit of time or it might be some guidance or recommendations to help them set up their procedures or it might be assistance when it comes to you know the deposit process and preserving data so it could be support that's at a, a kind of national service level as well but I think it's really important that there is support in place because you can't just have a policy and expect researchers to respond without there being help. So definitely the culture's a problem. Are there other things that come up as a challenge? And I noticed when we asked before about what people do, um, a few of you had said that you're supporting people and reviewing DMPs. Do you have experiences there to share or questions and comments? And if, if people want to, by all means, switch on the microphone if it's easier to just make a comment. No, it doesn't seem that anyone wants to start <laughs> talking, apart from you and me. <laughs> That's fine. And actually, just to let you know, I mean, this this is a, a kind of a trial thing we're doing with open air. We didn't, we've done lots of webinars um, over the years and we thought it'd be good to try something different, you know, to make the content available in advance so you can then look at the content um, and then come along to the session and, and just have a QA and a at the session. It might be that that doesn't work as well or maybe these sessions need to be shorter if we run out of questions within you know 20 30 minutes yeah. so do let us know what you think about the format as well because this is a, a trial that we're doing yeah and something we can adjust for the future webinars or training in general yeah so what i'd suggest is maybe given it a few minutes um, to see if more questions come in um, and if not we, we can wrap up. There's one here from Esther. How would you approach senior researchers to set up DMPs? Um, sorry I'll just open chat to read the end of that. Even if there's support present they may be reluctant to change practices. Yeah I, I think this can be a, a really big challenge. Um, sometimes senior researchers a, again, they can be very pressured because they're, they're running projects, they've got a lot of demands on them, um, so they may not have time for the DMP. I think one of the other issues, this is potentially a new area depending on their own skill sets, they may not have come across this before and it can be difficult if something's new, you know, to start learning that or to feel like you don't know what you're doing. So they might not be as open or, or, or willing to kind of reach out for support because they feel like they, they should know in their position, they should already know what, what they're doing. Um, 
So sometimes, I, I know a number of projects have often asked somebody else to do the DMP. Um, so maybe one of the more junior researchers is, is taking control of, of writing it. And actually something I reflected on in the slides, one of the trends we're seeing in UK universities is that um, a lot of universities are bringing in requirements for DMPs for PhD progression. So because PhD students are having to write their DMP and, and essentially update it at the end of the year and talk about how they're managing their data on their project, senior researchers and like lead PIs are getting familiar with those because they're the ones who have to sign off the, the DMPs from their PhD students. So that's a way of kind of infiltrating and training without it being direct training for the you know, for the lead academics. Essentially, they're having a role of reviewing the DMPs, which is helping to raise awareness of what should be in them and what makes a good DMP and what questions to ask when you're assessing them. Um, so that is potentially a, a good way as well. And I know when a number of UK unis have done training courses for senior academics, they've often not pitched them as training courses. They've talked about having a research briefing and they've kept something very short. So it's a lot more like a I don't know, like a senior academic meeting rather than the here's what we'll teach you to do. Um, so I think maybe the pitching of what you're doing is also important to consider. Other um, questions. Uh, the first one is about how to comply with private data sharing if data needs to be fair and open. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing I would say about both fair and open is that neither of them um, kind of contravene or, or kind of supersede um, conditions around data um, privacy. So GDPR, data protection, whatever legislation is in your country, um, it's still important to make sure that you safeguard participants of your data. Um, so fair and open, as I mentioned before, uh, both scales. Sorry, that's my colleague's phone just going off. I'm just going to mute that. Um, so they're both they're both scales, and you can make your data as open as possible. But if there are sensitivities or around the nature of the data and it needs to be kept private or only shared with certain groups, that's not a problem. And I think one of the key things about FAIR is actually that data can be FAIR and shared under restrictions. FAIR doesn't mean open, so there isn't a conflict at all there with, with GDPR. But I think with both of them, um, just bear in mind that you are able to have restrictions on sharing. They're, they're essentially ideals that you're um, working towards and trying to get the greatest degrees of fairness and openness, but you still need to safeguard participants in your research. And if I can advertise an open air service, um, open air developed yeah. a, a software for data anonymization called Amnesia. I'm going to put a link in the chat for you to have like a look at it. And if you want to explore its functionalities, you are more than free to do that because it's a, it's a free software. Uh, okay, fantastic. There's another question. Um, so in Sweden, yeah. Funders aren't yet making uh, mandating researchers to set up uh, DMPs. So, what would be the suggestion on how to approach them to motivate them? Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's interesting because in some countries, like um, in Sweden and, and in Australia, the funder requirements have, have come later. Um, and that, in some senses, has provided quite a fertile ground for institutions to, to define their approach and decide what they want to do. So in Australia, I know some institutions have, um, they've done more advocacy on the ground and, and had internal policies that encourage DMPs. And, and it depends on uh, the institution, what they've done, but um, it might be that you target a certain group um, like early career researchers or PhDs, um, rather than you know having a blanket policy for the whole institution. Um, but I, but I think the, the key thing when you are in a situation where there aren't requirements is to really focus on the benefits for the individual. That's what DMP should be about anyhow. I think I, I find it a little bit of a, 
it can be problematic at times in the UK that we have so many requirements because then researchers feel like they're being bashed from all all angles, their university and their funder are saying they have to do this. Um, and it can give people quite a bad attitude towards things because it seems like a burden. So I think if you haven't got those requirements, it can be a good opportunity to, to really focus on the benefits of researchers and to have something that um, is a lot more research focused. You know, it's actually about what is useful for the researchers to discuss and decide rather than what the funder wants to know to make you know certain compliance checks so you could do more kind of engagement with the research community about what's valuable to them in terms of their data management and to to understand issues they've had in the past and it might be that they've had issues sharing data across their consortium or maybe they've had issues because they're working across multiple countries um, and then you can start to pick up on some of those in their data management approach instead so you're not so driven by some external requirement which might not be a good fit for for their needs and there's another question by Garrett as and as it is long, a long one, I'll let you read it through. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so Garrett says there's a lot of research data that's been produced prior to the best practice approaches that are fair and open. Um, so good RDM evidence. So example, good RDM evidenced in DMPs. What criteria should we recommend that can be retrospectively applied to make these data sets fairer and more open? So um, a couple of points I'd make here. I think some data that's already available um, will have been addressing fairness and, and openness even before these concepts were, were kind of coined. So this is one of the points we make in the Fair Data Expert Group report that um, a lot of different research communities have developed practices around how they format and structure and share their data. So essentially they've been adopting FAIR without it being called FAIR. Um, so I think there will already be some research that's well structured and, and reusable and in many cases also openly available. Um, but there will be some legacy data which, you know, isn't really fair, isn't very reusable. Um, and I, th I think there's a question about what to do about that. Having my very first job was working in a repository um, where I was kind of liaising with researchers bringing materials into the repository. And we, we kind of focused on rather than doing too much about legacy material, focusing on getting things right from now. And I would err with that approach because there's still a lot of data being created now. Um, and I think trying to improve practice from where we are is probably more achievable than being too retrospective. Um, but we did talk about legacy data in the context of the FAIR data expert group. And what we suggested there is that that should really be determined by community needs. So if there is a legacy data set, which isn't very fair, um, there should be opportunities for people to make a case for that and to say, well, this data set could be hugely valuable if you know it was better described, if it was better structured, and to be able to make um, the case for actually doing that work. But I don't think we should apply um, any kind of blanket retrospective policies to make legacy data fair because they might not all be that valuable. I think that has to be a judgment about which data sets that's most useful to apply to. Um, but yeah, I'd focus the effort mostly if if I was implementing the policy myself at you know the institution, I'd focus on improving practice from now and potentially doing some work with some legacy data sets, but not all of them. And there are some schemes, so I'm trying to think what they call it, but at TU Delft, they have um, they have some, I think it's called a data rescue fund. So they have some resources at the institutional level that can be used to try and improve previous data sets. Um, so something like that could be a good scheme if, if you did think there's legacy data that's valuable to, to improve. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for this. So any, we're quarter two, so any final questions? We've actually had a good crop of questions, lots of different things coming in. Yeah. 
if no other question is coming, I would take advantage of <laughs> this webinar <laughs> to announce um, um, another Q&A session uh, that is taking place tomorrow around fair data and trusted repositories with Marion Grothfeld from Dance at 1 p.m. Yeah. That will yeah, the be probably every day. complementing uh, the information that Sarah already provided you today. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole program all week um, of different webinars and Q&A sessions. Some of them will be formal presentations. Um, some have been pre-recorded. So it would be useful, by all means, come to other ones. Let us know what you think about the sessions, what's worked well, uh, and what you'd like to see in future from them. Yeah, we would like very much to hear from you and have your suggestions. OK, I thank you very can, much. We can close it um, right now. And thank you, everybody, for uh, participating and for asking your questions. And you will find the recordings uh, on the Open Air website next week. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye.